human beings across the entire lifespan have only four phases of metabolism and everyone goes through them in exactly the same way. We need metabolism to survive. We need metabolism to function. We need metabolism to... Welcome to Commune. My name is Jeff Krasno. Today on the show, we're exploring metabolism. Now, simply put, metabolism refers to the total amount of chemical processes that occur within living organisms, including humans, to maintain life. It involves the conversion of nutrients from the food that we consume into energy, as well as the synthesis and breakdown of other molecules necessary for life and cellular function. Now, metabolism can be divided into two main categories, catabolism and anabolism. Now, during catabolism, complex molecules like carbohydrates, fats, and proteins are broken down into simpler substrates that are then leveraged by the cell to produce adenosine triphosphate, ATP, our cell's primary energy currency. Now, in anabolism, the molecules are synthesized. In this phase, simpler molecules are used to build more complex ones. For example, building blocks like amino acids are aggregated together to form muscle tissue, enzymes, neurotransmitters, transport molecules, and others. Now, these catabolic and anabolic processes are tightly regulated to maintain a balance, ensuring that the body has enough energy and enough building blocks for cellular function. Now that's not too complicated, right? It's like Lego, construction and destruction, yang and yin. Now today's episode is a series of excerpts from fascinating conversations I've had about human metabolism. Now first up is Dr. William Lee, physician, scientist, and best-selling author who presents recent research that upends our traditional understanding of human metabolism. So if you've ever thought that you were just born with slow metabolism or that your metabolism is slowing down as you age, well, get ready to have your world turned upside down. So without further delay, I present Dr. William Lee, on the four phases of human metabolism, as well as what you can do to optimize your metabolism over time. I used to th say things like, well, I was just born with a slow metabolism. That was just kind of the, the, uh, the hand um, that I was dealt by the dealer of life. Um, and, uh, and now, you know, I'm going to have to go through, uh, you know, all of these excess, you know, you know, starving myself and working out, you know, two hours a day and all of this kind of stuff to try to combat my genetic code. Is there any validity to this, to this claim? <laughs> yeah, well, look, this is, this is the other mic drop in my book, which is the new science of human metabolism. And it is so new that I can tell you it's less than 24 months old. So that's mm -hmm. how it's like smoking new science. Um, so two years ago, uh, a, pub, a, a landmark paper was published in the journal Science, which is the discovery journal for true science. It's one of the top scientific journals in the world, very hard for anything other than landmark discoveries to be published in. And, <clears throat> and this study, by the way, which I'm gonna tell you about, pretty much upended and changed everything we know about human metabolism, including the assumption that your genetics dictate your fate based on the metabolism. And here's what they did. There were 90 scientists that got together as a team, 90, that's a lot of people. And they, uh, and they, they all came from 20 different countries and they studied 6,000 people. They studied the metabolism of 6,000 people using the exact same technique. Here's what they did. They gave them a little drink of water H2O, all right? H in water is hydrogen. O is oxygen, so H2O. What they did is the researchers did, they tweaked the hydrogen, they tweaked the oxygen so you can measure it. You can, and, and, and the measurement, once you drank the water, if you measured it in your breath, it would give you a readout of your metabolism, what happened to the hydrogen, what happened to the oxygen. You can measure it in your blood. You can measure it in your urine, your pee, 
Okay, so they measured 6,000 people using the exact same method, unprecedented, largest study of human metabolism ever attempted to be undertaken. And what they did, and this was a super surprising thing, they studied uh, in that 6,000 group people that were two days old, newborns, all the way to 90 years old. So that's the entire mm. lifespan, the human lifespan. And they wanted to ask, using the exact same technique, what was human metabolism? So what do you think they found? Their results, when they when they did the results, and looked at everyone's metabolism, uh, it's just as you expect. It's all over the map, everywhere. All right? And no, not surprising, right? That's what you see when you look around, you talk to people. However, we live now at a time where we can do supercomputing, and we can develop incredibly sophisticated algorithms and pull out data. And so what they did this research team uh, developed an algorithm in which they could put the data of everyone's metabolism, every one of the 6,000, through this algorithm to um, remove the effect of excess body fat. So maybe, meaning that if you're a little baby uh, uh, and here's your size, you could remove mm -hmm. out the effect of excess body fat to see what the metabolism is. If you were middle-aged mm -hmm. and you were um, overweight, they could remove the effect of excess body fat. If you're elderly and thin, they could actually you know, um, correct for that to figure out what the metabolism should be. And when they did that, it was like pulling the cloak off of the statue of David. They found that human beings across the entire lifespan have only four phases of metabolism and everyone goes through them in exactly the same way. That's our hardwiring. And the first stage of metabolism is when we're born. We are all born with the same metabolism. And the moment we're out of our mom's womb, our metabolism skyrockets for the first year. So stage one is really the first year of life. And we rocket up to 50% higher than our adult metabolism is gonna be. All right, so that's stage one. Stage two, from one year old to 20 years old, okay, um, our metabolism goes down, 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 down. Now, why is that a surprise? Because anybody who has kids will know that when your teenagers are eating two dinners and bouncing off the walls <laughs> and sprouting yeah. up, right? Like you're like, oh man, their metabolism is going crazy, right? Wrong. It is actually slowing down to adult size. They're getting bigger. They're getting more mass, mm -hmm. but their metabolism, the hardwired metabolism is actually slowing down. Get, getting to cruising altitude where you're going to be, that's phase two. Here's the real surprise. From age 20 to age 60, they discovered that human metabolism from age 20 is exactly the same. 30, 40, 50, 60. It's a flat line. Our metabolism is hardwired not to change as human beings from 20 to 60. This means through your birth of your first child, through a divorce, through menopause, in your 40s and 50s and 60s, just because you're middle-aged doesn't mean that your, your metabolism is gonna change, you're gonna gain more weight. It is hardwired to be exactly stable. What this mm. means is profound. It means that 60 can be the new 20 if you allow your metabolism to do its thing. Now, I'm going to come back to that. Like, so why do people's metabolism change? That's stage three. Stage four is a final stage from 60 to 90. Your metabolism decreases about 17%. Not that much. Okay. So that means that when you're 90 years old, your metabolism is only 17% of what it was when you were 20. All right. Hmm. This is actually, this is so new, so profound that all the old textbooks of human metabolism are being ripped up and thrown out. And the new books haven't even been written yet. They're being written right now. So this is like, you know, so what we're talking about is really a profound re um, uh, conceptualization of how the human body works. Now, so why do people have different metabolisms, right? Why, why do people actually curse their metabolism and blame their genetics? It's because when in this research, they added back the effect of excess body fat, <laughs> put it back. You crush your metabolism. You crush your hardwired metabolism. So what that means is it's not that a slow metabolism that you're born with causes you to grow body fat and gain weight. It's the other way around. Excess body fat and gaining weight crushes your metabolism. It's the other way around completely. And what that means is that the power of allowing our inner hardwired metabolism to resurrect itself, to fly, 
lies in our hands to be able to control excess body fat. We can't change our genetics, but we can actually manipulate excess body fat. That is just a game changer, Will. I mean, and in some ways, I, I kind of, um, when, I, when I try to classify this era that we're in, in medical science, I think about it as sort of the end of genetic de determinism, where, you know, all of this, these new efflorescent emerging fields of, of, of science around metabolism, but also neuroplasticity and epigenetics and the microbiome is actually saying, no, we're not fixed. Uh, our fates are not fixed, um, you know, by our genes. Yes, genes can predispose us for, for certain things, and there's certain, you know, you know, single nucleotide polymorphisms or whatever mutations that can give us more proclivities towards developing this and that. But in a way, it's sort of doing what Einstein and Bohr and Planck did to Newtonian physics. It's just upending the whole thing, and it's saying, like, we are in this age of agency where if you begin to actually understand how the keys fit into the lock, you can upgrade, uh, you know, your human f flourishing. And, yeah. and it's not just about the individual, it's about society. So this is just unreal, man. Yeah, <laughs> it's I mean, it, 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 really, it really is mind-blowing. And the key thing is that, you know, although biohacking is a very popular idea, the fact is that your body biohacks itself all the time. And right. the idea that you can eat to actually improve your metabolism, fight harmful body fat, um, allow your in hardwired metabolism to rise to the surface. That means that, our, I mean, truly, our, the agency of our health when it comes to our metabolism is in our own, own hands. And so basically, now you start to understand exactly what happens during the 20 to 60 year old age, right? Because even though our metabolism is hardwired to be rock stable, so many things happen to our lives. We have social stresses, financial stresses, we've got depression, we've got you know new jobs that actually sit, make us couch potatoes, um, all kinds mm -hmm. of things that happen to us in real life. We're inundated with marketing. Um, you know, we develop bad habits. And what winds up happening is that then we start to um, overeat, load up on, put poor quality fuel into our body. By the way, that back to the gas station and the car again, if you put good quality gas in your brand new car, your engine's gonna run longer. If right. you put crappy quality gas in your engine, you know, your car's gonna run that day. It'll run the next day and the next day after that. But over time, you keep loading your car with poor quality gas, it's gonna conk out your engine. It's not gonna run so long. And so the quality of food really matters a lot. Yeah, and, and I, I assume the foods that are the most obesogenic or that contribute most to the development of excess visceral fat are the ones that we kind of know, right? They're like trans fats within fried food and seed oils, refined sugars and refined grains and starches, ultra processed foods. Are there any other categories that you would lump in there? Yeah. Well, let me kind of paint the picture first. The yeah. foods that actually help us grow extra body fat happen to be the foods that are easy to overconsume. Mm. Either they're engineered that way from a marketing perspective to stimulate our brain to be addicted to the food, or that we're naturally just sort of overeat uh, them anyway, like in there, we're influenced by the marketing or by society uh, to be able to, to, to eat those things. But it turns out that, you know, ultra processed foods uh, contain artificial preservatives, artificial coloring, artificial flavoring, additives. What do those things do? Well, we don't always absorb all those things for our own nutrition, but we pass down all those chemicals uh, out of whatever's in that box or that bag, okay? We pass all that stuff down to our gut bacteria. And when we poison our gut microbiome, it's like pouring um, uh, uh, Drano or, uh, uh, like into the water by the, by the Great Barrier Reef. You're going to start burning and killing things right where it enters. And basically, when we start burning and killing our gut microbiome, all heck breaks loose. Inflammation starts to skyrocket. If you had some extra body fat that was getting inflamed because it was growing too big for its blood supply, now your gut microbiome isn't able to counter the inflammation. You've just poured gasoline onto that fire. Whoosh. Now you've got a raging forest fire. 
all right? Um, you cut that gut, gut microbiome, now you've compromised your immune system, right? Um, now you're going to be much more vulnerable to disease. Uh, you've compromised your ability to heal. And that's why these um, nutrient light, uh, you know, they call the so-called empty calories, are the really the counterpoint to the foods that do prevent us from actually gaining excess body fat. These are the nutrient-dense foods. Nutrient-dense is a term that, you know, I... I I only say it because people have heard about it, but it's almost a meaningless phrase. But what, I, what it really means is that there's a lot of, it, it's good fuel, high quality fuel. Not only does it have energy, but in addition to the energy, it has all kinds of other goodies for our body and our metabolism and our health defenses. One thing often in plant-based foods, especially you get dietary fiber. Now, not only are you getting good quality fuel, you are now also getting fiber to feed your gut microbiome. Your pets at home are very happy because you've given them really high quality food. They pay you back by actually lowering inflammation, helping your metabolism, lowering your blood lipids, and helping you heal faster and, be, and more optimally, all right? So fiber, what about, what about the other really important ca uh, category of bioactives? Bioactives are these natural chemicals. Mm -hmm. The lycopene, the sulforaphanes, the catechins, the flavonoids, you name them. There are thousands of these chemicals. And we're now beginning to pinpoint what the sulforaphane do to white fat. It makes it go beige. What the sulforaphane do to stem cells in fat, adipose stones, so makes them turn into brown fat instead of more white fat. What about lycopene? Similar, chlorogenic acid in apples and pears and coffee. What do they do? They trigger thermogenesis. They turn on the space heater of brown fat. So now you can kind of see eating plant-based foods, okay, um, uh, uh, you know, and when I say plant-based foods, whole plant-based foods, you know, mm -hmm. fruits, vegetables, nuts, seeds, legumes, healthy oils, the usual, right? I mean, this is not news. I'm not, I'm, I'm not telling you the good stuff is we, we're beginning to, it's becoming second nature what's good food. What we're beginning to understand now is why the natural chemicals activate our metabolism, burn down harmful fat by activating good fat. And this is how you can eat to beat your diet, which is why I, I, I called my book Eat to Beat Your Diet. It's a trick title. Even though the word diet's on the cover, it's not a diet book. It is an anti-diet book because it shows you how are this remarkable human bodies engineered to be able to give us our optimal metabolism by eating the right foods. Yeah, it's so great. And, and the way that you frame it in the book, I think it's really just important for people because you can burn fat, get healthy, and still enjoy your life and enjoy food and actually eat it in some quantity. Um, but it just really needs to be the right foods. And you know, you've put your thumb on fiber and on many of these, you know, bioactives like quercetin and luteolin that essentially turn on your mitochondria, your mm -hmm. energy factors, uh, factories uh, in, in your cells um, that are prevalent in, in brown fat, as you mentioned. And, um, and then, you know, you've identified, uh, you know, 150 um, of these very, very potent foods that contain these bioactives and fiber and polyphenols, et cetera. Um, and you've done so in a way where people can make the connections very easily. They can say, okay, quercetin, I get it. That helps really, you know, jumpstart uh, my mitochondria, for example. Well, where do I get that? Where well, I can get that in cherries and blueberries and blackberries, right? And you, you really do an amazing job there. And then you, you really set forth a program that is... Um, it's not onerous at all. In fact, it can be just full of, uh, of a tremendous amount of enjoyment while you're also getting healthy and feeling great. So can you just uh, explain a little bit how you put together the program? And then um, I, I love the Mediterranean diet because I've never heard that uh, proposed before. So maybe you can uh, you know, pull on that theme a little bit. Yeah. Well, look... Um People always ask me, Dr. Lee, you study food as medicine. What kind of diet are you on? Like that's a, that's a typical <laughs> question I get asked. And I always tell people, as I wrote in the introduction, you know, I'm not into diets. I'm not into fad diets, crash diets, extreme diets. I'm, I'm really not into that because those things generally are about elimination. Um, they, they, they don't 
work very well. You rebound off them. You yo-yo off of them. Um, and and it's really many times those diets are really about um, vanity. And I'm all about inner health. Now I I right. do I do completely wholeheartedly support people if you want to look good and you feel good. That's fantastic. But I, as a doc, scientist and a doctor, I want I really wanted to work my research into inner health, which is about your metabolism and that hidden body fat mm-hmm. and how to use it. Okay, so I tell people simply, I, I don't follow a diet, but I do have a way, uh, a, a, an approach to eating. And I call that approach mediterranean. And um, my background is Asian. I grew up eating Chinese food, and I love Asian food. And I actually lived during a gap year before I became a doctor. I lived in the Mediterranean. I lived in Greece. I lived in Italy. You know, I, mm. I literally walked the walk long before I started to talk to talk. And when I was in the Mediterranean, I was there to study um, the relationship between food, culture, and health. How did people kind of roll all these together into a natural, everyday um, a sense of self and identity? And of course, one of the things that you mentioned that is central to how I put the pro- my program together in Eat to Beat Your Diet is the word joy. Mm. Diets are not about joy, but food should be about joy. If you look at those really revered food cultures, culinary cultures, traditional foods out of the Mediterranean, which is, by the way, is like 20 some countries all surrounding the Mediterranean Sea, not just Italy, Greece and Spain. Um, and then in Asia, um, there's 40 some countries. It's not just China, Japan, Thailand, Vietnamese, you know, the food. There's a there's many, many different um, uh, countries that are out there. It is a it is really a kaleidoscope of know how of selecting food ingredients to put them together and guess what these ingredients happen to be the very same ones in both mediterranean and asian cultures that i write about in my book that activate your metabolism and they activate Mm. your health defenses and so what i tell people is that i naturally how i eat naturally is mediterranean it's really either mediterranean or asian or some combination i write about the science and if you're interested in the science and you really want to kind of go deep it's all there all right but if you really just want to know what you should be eating that's common sense and practical and absolutely delicious and can actually align your desire for having inner health and the enjoyment of food, you should try how what, how I do it, which is Mediterranean, either way or in the middle. And um, and you're going to you're going to really enjoy every meal, every meal you're going to be um talking about what you're eating, you're going to be thinking about what you're eating. I don't know if you've ever gotten together with friends in uh, in either Italy, uh, either in the Mediterranean or in Asia, but you mm-hmm. know what they do in those countries? This is what I observed during my gap year. When they sit down, before they sit down, they're anticipating the deliciousness of what they're going to eat. In fact, mm-hmm. indeed, they choose what they're going to eat based on what they feel like eating. They're looking forward to it. When they sit down as a family or as friends, People in the Mediterranean or in Asia, they talk about their food. They're talking about the seasonality, how it's prepared and how their mom made it, how amazing it actually is. Um, And and then when they leave their meal, they're grateful that they actually had such a delicious meal and they know it did something good for them. All right. That's the long culture. And this whole idea of Mediterranean, by the way, sounds like a new concept. But what I write about my book, Eat to Beat Your Diet, is that, in fact, it's a 2,000-year-old tradition that was once connected, the Mediterranean Asian, by the Silk Road that 2,000 years ago stretched across the long, long, biggest continental mass and connected Asia with the Mediterranean. And back then, people on camelback, traders, exchange recipes and ingredients and ate each other's food and they really enjoyed themselves along the way and learned from other people and that's what i want people who are reading my book to appreciate is that there is a way of going back you know our future can be gleaned from going looking back at the past looking at how some of these incredibly um delicious food cultures traditional food cultures brought their ingredients forward assembled them together if you're into the science, I put all the science there. If you're just interested sure. in the history of the ingredient, by the way, I also talk about the history of all the ingredients just because it's interesting. You know, did you know that the pear, the pear actually came from Eurasia? It actually came from the Western, Western China. You know, like 
That's kind of interesting. Do you know that carrots, mm. which came from Southwest Asia, were originally purple on the outside and bright yellow on the inside? Um, so again, you know, like there's so many fascinating things about foods that fight body fat and elevate our metabolism and therefore elevate our health while giving us joy. Yeah, so great, man. I mean, I'm a little bit of a geek, so I like to know about elagic acid and how it gets converted in the gut to urolithin A and how urolithin A is connected to the mitochondria and you can get that through walnuts and pomegranates. Like I, I'm into that, but I'm also super interested uh, in the in the community component yeah. of food, you know, like you said, and you can really look at at a lot of cultures and their different traditions, um, and, and borrow, uh, you know, respectfully from from them. You know, we have a you know just a a, a ritual around our house that I've mentioned before on the podcast called Rosebud Thorn, where we go around the table and we all talk about what our rose, our bud, and our thorn of our day was. And, you know, what it does, it starts this kind of community interaction and we move out of our sympathetic nervous system and this kind of like cortisol infused uh, fight or flight mentality that the, you know, modern media culture is sort of creating. And we sort of come back here to this kind of parasympathetic state and the blood kind of goes back into our gut. And, you know, we, you can actually start metabolism and digestion, like you say, before you even put anything in your mouth because you can ready your body and upgrade it for proper digestion. Um, I mean, obviously, even enzymes start to, and, and digestive enzymes start to form, you know, in saliva in your mouth before you even take a bite. So, right. you know, this is a, a full picture. And, um, and you really, um, uh, you know, beautifully articulate the kind of the full picture from the geekiness to the joy um, in in your new book. And I, I really just enjoyed, you know, every bit of it. It's so well crafted, well researched, it's insightful. Um, and it's very, very practical. Um, because as you say, there's a lot of people that are just like, well, Dr. Lee, tell me what to eat. <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, I'll start adopting those protocols and matching them to my own bio individuality. But I think, you know, the message here that is, um, again, just so uplifting and empowering is that we have so much agency over this notion of metabolism. And, and you know, that's directly connected to longevity. And I don't necessarily mean living forever, but this idea of morbidity, compression, and matching our health span, these amount of years that we are thriving and feeling great and engaged and vibrant with our lifespan. And that has really run contrary to some of the trends that we've seen uh, in the Western world where, you know, the last 16 years of our lives were, you know, plagued by all of these chronic illnesses and, you know, we're on this kind of poly cocktail of pharmaceuticals and, you know, what we really want is a life that is full and thriving and then, you know, to, to compress that, that, that um, period of, of decline into the shortest period possible. And, and, you know, I think you've given us so many keys there. Yeah, no, I mean, thank you for the opportunity to share um, this work with you. I'm really excited about it because not only is it really talking about the new science of the human body when it comes to metabolism, but it does actually set up a, 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 a much deeper understanding of how to live long and prosper, as they used to say on Star Trek, you know, mm -hmm. the, the whole Spock saying, because that's actually exactly, well, that's exactly <laughs> what we want though, right? We want to live as long as we can be prosperous. And that prosperity is not just, you know, it's not just the Benjamins. It's really like inner prosperity is a, is a newfound appreciation because chronic disease is not our destiny. I think our mm -hmm. destiny is really hardwired into us. Like our destiny is health. As long as we keep um, doing the right things and taking care of our car, going back to the car analogy, our engine is going to run for a long, long time. You need good quality fuel. You need to take care of all the, the parts of it. And by the way, it's not just what you eat. It's when you eat and how you eat. And not just eating, it also partnered up with movement and physical activity. And it's also um, uh, partnered up with sleep and stress management. And so, you know, I think that um, one of the things that I really try to do in, in, in my new book, Eat to Beat Your Diet, is really to give people, deliver 
on that sort of bleeding edge science that everyone likes to hear about that, you know, when I when I'm involved, because that's what I do. I'm a scientist. But I also mm-hmm. wanted to make sure that it really addressed, you know, all of these societal things that we've got to deal with. Our stress. Are we getting enough sleep? Are we supposed to be exercising? Um, and then when it comes to food, well, that is the medicine that we take three times a day. That is complete agency for us to be able to make those decisions. And you know what? Even if you skip a meal every now and then, that's absolutely okay. You're giving your body, your our hardwire, our machinery a little more chance to actually do that fuel burning. And that's why, by the way, I explain metabolism in simple terms that make sense to everyone as opposed to going into the biochemistry of it because even myself i used to get confused when somebody was explaining metabolism (laughs) to me when i was in medical school i'm like oh my god it's like too much uh i i can't memorize everything and now what i'm saying is that you don't need to it turns out that discoveries teach us our metabolism is beautifully wired to run in that goldilocks zone as long as we uh, we really try to uh, uh, try to groom it and and help it stay in that happy zone. So, in summary, contrary to common belief, the study in the Journal of Science showed that human metabolism remains relatively stable from age twenty to sixty. And this finding completely challenges the assumption that genetics dictate metabolism throughout one's life. And The revelation implies that allowing metabolism to function optimally through how one eats, through physical activity, through regulating sleep and stress management, how all of that can contribute to your greater well-being. Okay, next up is Lat Manser, PhD. In our conversation, we explore the principal hormones related to metabolism, the relationship between Alzheimer's and insulin resistance, and the knock-on impacts of the ketogenic diet. Okay, without further delay, here's Lat Manser. So I'm excited to get into all things metabolism uh, with you, and this is obviously such a a relevant topic, um, given that some 90% of Americans are metabolically dysfunctional. so perhaps just to lay some foundational groundwork for the audience, I think it would be helpful to have a good working uh, definition and understanding of metabolism. So could you provide a good um, definition of metabolism to start? So metabolism, all 8 billion of us, do, we do metabolism at all times, right? So we need metabolism to survive. We need metabolism to function. We need metabolism to do everything. And metabolism is broken down into anabolism and catabolism. Anabolism is building and storage and catabolism is breaking down and utilizing what we have in our storage. And we are constantly in a state of flux between one and two, between both of them. And we switch one up and we switch the other one down depending on what state we are in. If we are fed, we want to be in anabolism, an anabolic state, so that we we store the food that we eat. If we are fasting or if we're working out, we want to be in catabolism because we are breaking down the materials that we've stored and we've eaten to produce energy and improve performance. So that's metabolism in general, right? It's being able to use the building blocks or substrates that we consume in order to produce energy and we need energy to survive. metabolically healthy and metabolically unhealthy, those terms, the way I see it, is essentially how well you utilize different substrates at the time that it needs to be used optimally. So, for example, if you're doing very high-intensive exercise, glucose is more beneficial because it creates energy almost independent of oxygen in the first part of glucose metabolism called glycolysis. So it's Mm -hmm. oxygen independent ATP generation. So ATP is the energy currency in the cell. When you go on endurance race or long distance races, you want to be able to metabolize your fats because your fat contains way more energy and we store up to 20 to 40,000 calories worth of energy in 
the form of fat in our bodies versus 2,000, around 2,000 in glucose. So if we are going to work out for a long time, we want to be able to tap into that storage. So metabolically healthy people will be able to switch between substrates when they need to. So that's the term metabolically flexible. Mm. Or metabolic flexibility, that's where it comes in. You're flexible in terms of switching between substrates. So I hope, hope that uh, clear things mm. up. That's a fantastic definition. Uh, I've heard metabolically flexible uh, used in the context of a, a metaphor that you, you become like a Prius, right? So you can um, kind of shift between the use of electricity or petrol for fuel, um, and there's an analogy there with the human body that you become uh, very adept at switching between essentially the, the using glucose or, or using fat. Now, those are the primary foundational substrates for fuel, um, fat and glucose. Is, is one of them more, um, I guess, calorie dense or energy dense than the other? That would be fat. So fat contains nine calories per gram versus glucose is four calories per gram. Same with uh, protein that is four calories per gram. So obviously I didn't say, I didn't talk about protein because we don't want to break down protein uh, because proteins are essentially very, very valuable to us um, as it makes up not just, you know, when people think about protein, they think about muscles, not just muscles yeah, um, that are made of protein. But if you, if you really learn the biochemistry on, on cell biology and physiology, all the different enzymes, hormones, and everything are essentially made out of proteins, right? So there are proteins, that, amino acids, there are different, different sequences and different structures being bound together to create this wonderful biochemistry of life. And we don't want to break down that. So we want to be able to, that's why we want to be able to be very flexible in order to tap into our fats or glucose because those substrates will primarily um, made to to be either stored or broken down for energy and then there is now ketones uh, which is six calories per gram uh, six to seven so that's that's the um another form of energy if you would that we have never in human history been able to consume directly we have to make our own ketones so we can go into that um, in a bit if you you know, I'll, I'll let you lead the conversation on what you want the audience to understand first. Yeah, well, this is when, when two podcast hosts come head to head. Who leads, right? Um, <laughs> I mean, it's your, it's your podcast. I, I always enjoy. Actually, you know what? I do enjoy being on both sides. Like sometimes I, what, I enjoy just asking the questions. Sometimes I'm like, you know, I'm just going to sit at the back seat and let them explore my brain. And sometimes yeah. it's surprising. I find myself being surprised by myself because these people are able to draw answers that I never knew would come up from me. Mm. Yes, yeah. Yeah, I love the way that you describe um, the sensitive balance between uh, anabolic processes and catabolic processes. And essentially, you know, healthy systems work um, in this kind of tenuous homeostasis, right? So we, we, we need both. Um, and then you pointed to proteins. So, you know, we often think of proteins or the building blocks of proteins, amino acids going to muscular creation. But uh, as you pointed out, you know, there's hundreds of thousands of proteins in the body, transport molecules, enzymes, et cetera, including hormones. So I want to shift just the conversation for a second to talk about these two peptide hormones that are sort of the yang yin of metabolism, and that is insulin and glucagon. Uh, glucagon doesn't get nearly as much PR <laughs> as insulin, but could you talk a little bit about the role of those countervailing hormones uh, within the process of metabolism, and then potentially touch on insulin sensitivity and insulin resistance, because this seems to be at the upstream from a lot of these dysfunctional uh, metabolic um, syndromes, I suppose. Sure. So insulin is, you know, as you said, you know, glucagon did, doesn't get a lot of PR around this. So let's start with insulin, which most people have heard of. And 
insulin essentially gets secreted by the pancreas, pancreatic beta cells, when we have high blood sugar. What it does is essentially send signals to the different cells to upregulate glucose transporters. And these transporters will then translocate up into the cell membrane so they can start pulling in the glucose from the blood and use it either for storage or for metabolism or breaking down and, and develop energy. So insulin, if you think about it, it's, it's more of an anabolic um, hormone. And then glucagon, it's more of the opposite. And what happens in insulin resistance is essentially the responsiveness and sensitivity of those cells being able to translocate those receptors up into the membrane is being dysfunctional. So you're sending signal, hey, it's like, think about you telling, um, you're moving house, right? You're telling the, the movers to pack things up and put it in the truck and let's move on. Usually, you know, they'll just do that. But this time, the truck drivers, are, you're like yelling at them. It's like, hey, you know, I'm like, I have a full of stuff in my house. Let's pack it up and let's put it in the truck. And they just won't listen. They just won't do it. So you end up with a cluster of, of stuff that you've packed and, you have, and it has nowhere to go. So essentially like that. So you have high blood sugar in your blood, uh, high blood sugar in your blood. And you keep telling yourself, hey, you know, bring it in so that you can lower your blood glucose and you can use it for storage. And the cells are like, no, I am... I'm full, I, I, I can't take in anymore, or I'm dysfunctional, I can't take in anymore, so you're on your own. So that's where insulin resistance becomes dangerous because a constant elevation of blood glucose, that's where all the complication comes in because that exposure to high blood glucose increases damage to your nerve cells, nervous system, increases damage to your kidney, increases damage to a lot of um, places, uh, in, in increases inflammation that could essentially lead to chronic diseases, you know, diabetes, cardiovascular disease. And, you know, now they are trying, they're, they're trying to figure out the mechanism of action, how that leads to Alzheimer's, as they mm. call type 3 diabetes. So then comes the question, what causes insulin resistance? This is, you know, always the forever debate. And yeah. I've had... Yeah amazing guest on on the hvm podcast podcast that i interviewed um dr ben bickman is one of them yeah expert. I, in fact i just want to interrupt you there i just listened to that episode and i vehemently encourage everyone to go and look up that episode on your podcast because that that conversation between you and ben uh you know i i know a little bit about this topic already but i had about 25 light bulbs go off and I hope we can cover some of, uh, of that, you know, as we get into it, but sorry to interrupt you, please go on. No, absolutely. Thank you so much for the shout out as well. And it was so um, gratifying to sit with Ben and me being a scientist who did my PhD in also uh, diabetes and cardiovascular disease to talk about his research and what is the current literature around insulin resistance. And I didn't even know before that, you know, um, that he did his research also in Singapore in the specific demographic group, which is very relevant to me, you know, being my, my genetic makeup coming from Malaysia, half of, uh, you know, my, my mom is Chinese, my dad's Malay. So that is very relevant because my mom's side of the family has really high prevalence of diabetes. So we got into such deep conversation. So when it comes to insulin resistance, there is a lot of theories and a lot of evidence as well that points towards it's the glucose, it's the high consumption of glucose. But then I also interviewed these two authors of Mastering Diabetes book yeah. um, <laughs> and they believe it's the fats. And they use high glucose, low fat diet to combat diabetes. And they have seen some good results. So ultimately, I think what it is, is the combination of all. It's, it's, there's no point to demonize one particular substrate versus the other. It's a combination of your lifestyle versus what you eat as a whole picture. If you have high processed sugar, in excess, as well as in presence of high seed oil, which drives inflammation, 
and you add on top of that high fat content, which makes your calories intake go above and beyond, then you that is the recipe of the, for disaster. And that could be the cause of insulin resistance rather than one substrate causing it. Yeah, no, it's so interesting. I mean, clearly we've seen a massive and arguably detrimental increase in the consumption of carbohydrates, so uh, sugar, refined grains, ultra-processed foods, etc. But it does seem to be that that uh, caustic combination of high um, glucose in your blood that's triggering high insulin, so anabolic, in conjunction with excess calories, that there's something there that's that's causing some major problems. And in that conversation with Ben, I thought it was interesting because... You know, as you become more insulin resistant, your the sugar, the glucose in your bloodstream has got to go somewhere, right? So it, it gets stored as, as glycogen. Some of it gets glycated, becomes these advanced glycation end products and glycoproteins, et cetera. But then, you know, a lot of it is stored at, um, as triglycerides in fat cells. And, you know, you and Ben talk at great length about how as fat cells get bigger, um, through hypertrophy, it's all the adipokines and, and, and inflammatory cytokines that are secreted from those fat cells that then can uh, exacerbate insulin resistance. Can you un- unpack that a tiny bit? Yeah, that's like exactly what you just said, right? So a lot of people, they try to observe where there is high prevalence of heart attacks, high prevalence of diabetes, and then they look at their blood biomarkers. And then they see either high sugar or high fat or high adipokines, and then they straight away point towards that substrate. And that's a problem because just because these different substrates were present in these high prevalence disease cases doesn't mean that they cause it, right? So another example I'll give you, Bay Area, you know, famous for stabbings, right? There's a lot of stabbings around here. Every time there is a stabbing, you see a a ambulance there. Now, would you start thinking the ambulance caused the stabbing? Because every time there is stabbing, there is an ambulance, right? So, but we automatically know that they are there to help and not the one that caused it. So it's the same thing, right? So if there is a clot in your blood, you know, that people think cholesterol is bad. There is high cholesterol. But think about it. Is the cholesterol there to cause it or is the cholesterol trying to patch the insult to the blood vessel damage that has been done? So a lot of people argue that now. And a lot of people, and as we advance in technology and being able to detect what these different molecules are doing, that's where we can find out what is the cause and what is the correlation and what is the mechanism that is coming in to try and fix it. So as Ben said, you know, Ben, ben was explaining with his research that some people tend to put on fat via hypertrophy and some people tend to put on fat via hyperplasia. So hypertrophy is the, the enlargement of the cell itself and hyperplasia is divide, division of the cells and, and you just create more fat cells. And what he says is that in hypertrophy, um, these cells are getting bigger and bigger and start leaking these adipokines and increasing inflammation. And, and mind you, all of this tracks back to what we were talking earlier about the access of calories and the presence of high sugar and high fat and processed sugar and also other stuff that may disrupt your inflammatory system like seed oils and disrupt your microbiome and all of that. And that leads to the cells getting packed with high energy, right? High storage of fats. Not only it starts leaking out adipokines, but if you think about it, what is a reactive oxygen species? Reactive oxygen species is essentially, so when we talk about free radicals, that's part of reactive oxygen species, it is a byproduct of, of respiration, In your mitochondria, when we create energy, a mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell. So if you think about the cell creating energy, the mitochondria is part of the cell that creates all the energy for you. And that's where it metabolizes all these substrates for you. Glucose, fatty acid, all the same. It has that power, right? 
whenever they metabolize a substrate, they will produce some reactive oxygen species. Nonetheless, you know, it will produce it. Um, then people are like, well, we don't want that. We don't want, you know, uh, oxidative damage. We don't want free radical to damage our cells. But some form of free radical is actually needed for the mitochondria to adapt. It's called mitohomesis and adapt and create antioxidant because we create our own antioxidants such as melatonin and glutathione. But what happens in dysfunctional individuals is that this ROS production is in excess, right? You're producing too much. And if you, let's say just hypothetically, if you metabolize one gram of fat, you produce like, I don't know, the, just the arbitrary number, like 0.0, say 1% of that is, is ROS. Um, you know, you produce that, that amount. If you metabolize more fats, then you produce more ROS. So think about these hypertrophy, hypertrophic cells that has mm. huge amount of um, fats. You are increasing metabolism, right? You, you, are, you can tell that these people have very high metabolism, but they're like, well, why, why aren't they skinny? Because they are trying to keep up with the input, but at the same right. time, they are trying to metabolize it. Their body will always prioritize survivability, which means they are going to turn up the metabolism of these fat cells. And when you mm. turn up metabolism of these fat storage, you're also turning up ROS production. And when you turn up ROS production, you are sending signals to the cells either for cell death or sending signal to stop taking in uh, substrates, i.e. insulin resistance, or increase inflammatory biomarkers, which is a signal to say to your body that, hey, this is a red flag, we need help here. And, you know, your immune system go haywire. Yeah, so interesting. And uh, I think they also become hypoxic, right? Yeah. Uh, so hypoxic, can, low oxygen environment. Right. So that, that can have its own downstream impacts. Um, you know, it's so interesting because obviously when we talk about um, you know, sh shedding adipose tissue, we've seen a couple of different pathways to that work. I mean, you know, there's a plant-based diet, which is inherently low caloric. So we've seen that function. Uh, and then obviously there's the ketogenic diet, uh, which is very, very low carb. So very, very low insulin. And, and, you know, obviously we, we've seen that work also. So it, it does suggest that it is, that there is, it's a combination of these things. Um, so we talked a little bit about insulin uh, and its relationship to growth and its relationship to growth hormone, et cetera. Um, and insulin, of course, is a response, the pancreas is response to the consumption of carbohydrates and refined sugars and, and starches, et cetera, as we discussed. Talk a little bit then about glucagon. So and what are the processes um, in the body that glucagon triggers? Um, because in, very, in many ways, it's very much the opposite uh, of insulin. In low glucose states, your pancreas is going to produce glucagon. So talk a little bit about that. So remember when I talked about earlier on anabolism and catabolism? So one of the, the mechanisms that, that triggers anabolism is you know, insulin, right? Insulin draws in the, um, the substrates, and then you store it. So the opposite is catabolism, so glucagon. So glucagon senses that you are fasting for a long time, you know, your blood sugar is low. But if you think about it, even people who are fasting and people who are on ketogenic diet, they don't eat any carbs. And when you're fasting, you don't eat anything. But if you measure your blood glucose, you will still have a baseline blood glucose. Now, why mm -hmm. is that? It's because glucagon and the other enzymes in your body is creating sugar from your storage, either from your glycogen storage or from gluconeogenesis from other substrates, right? From, you know, fats or proteins or uh, glutamate and all of that. So that is the role of the counterbalance. Like you said, it's a beautiful, you know, homeostasis equilibrium that our body is constantly striving for. And most of the time, when we change certain things, we need to give the, the body time and also um, make the body recognize that that is the new 
homeostasis or no homostatic um, form. Um, and, and yeah, that's where, where it balances each other out. In this segment, Lat introduced the idea of metabolic flexibility, where like a Prius, the body can switch seamlessly between substrates such as glucose and fats based on its needs. Now, our bodies are constantly striving for balance, for homeostasis, regulating processes like insulin and glucagon release to maintain stable blood sugar levels. Disruptions in this balance, such as in insulin resistance, can lead to metabolic dysfunction and other complications. Further, different dietary approaches, such as plant-based diets and ketogenic diets, can influence metabolic processes. Our bodies adapt to changes in carbohydrate and fat intake, and these adaptations may impact insulin sensitivity and overall metabolic health. Now, these excerpts underscore how metabolism is a dynamic and highly regulated process that changes in relation to nutrient availability, energy needs, and even psychological states. By understanding and nurturing good metabolism through proper nutrition and lifestyle choices, we can aspire to a longer, more vibrant and healthier life. Now, if you enjoyed this show, please subscribe and hit the notification bell so you never miss an episode. Leave a comment to let us know your thoughts and don't forget to share our content with others who might benefit from this valuable information. Okay, that's all. From the commune for today, my name is Jeff Krasnow, and I am here for you.